So I'm Dr. Ashley Hughes. Um, I'm joined, to, I'm an associate professor um, at Metro Health and the Center for Clinical Informatics Research and Education. Um, and I am joined by Dr. Craig Jarrett. Craig, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Craig Jarrett. I'm a clinical informatics fellow. I work clinically as a cardiothoracic surgeon and I'm a PhD candidate at Case Western finishing my PhD in clinical informatics. Great, thank you. So today's session is going to focus on more of the intermediate skills that are required for using Cosmos database um, for performing more complex queries. So we have a few housekeeping items to uh, attend to before we get in and announcements before we get into the bulk of today's session. Um, so we will be doing a mini refresher, um, but also want to remind you all that Epic Training Online actually has some additional resources um, and that our last webinar, which was Cosmos Database for Beginners, is actually available um, through CTSC's website. We'll be providing the link in today's slides as well. Um, today, we're going to focus mainly on performing longitudinal data um, queries in uh, Cosmos Slicer Dicer um, with a focus on our use of sequential criteria um, and some advanced logic features. We'll also discuss the data visualization features as available through uh, Cosmos. And as we've mentioned in Cosmos overviews, this is a population uh, data set that queries millions of patients at once and billions of encounters. So we'll also briefly touch on how to um, allow queries to happen in the background um, because sometimes it can take a while for analyses to be completed on the national database in real time. We'll also talk a bit about how to export some of your queries as well in the form of figures and tables from Slicer Dicer. And of course, as you have questions, I encourage you to actually use the chat or pop it in the Q&A. Craig and I will be handing off between each other so that we can do some live demos today and show you how these features are applied in Cosmos Slicer Dicer. Um, but we will be um, looking at the chat. And uh, Jerry, if you're able to kind of help bring that to our attention, um, we will be um, looking at that. But we also want to have some dedicated time at the end for your questions and input. So our first announcements and housekeeping items. So we are hosting the first ever Northeast Ohio Regional Epic Cosmos Datathon, and you are formally invited to attend. So this datathon is essentially a hackathon, if you're familiar more with that term, happening Saturday, December 7th. It's anticipated to be an all-day event. We're going to be joined by Epic where we are going to have a friendly competition um, as to what teams can come up with the best research questions and queries to perform in Epic Cosmos. If you're interested in this at all, I'm assuming that most of you are interested in using Cosmos Slicer Dicer, please scan or follow the link directly from these slides uh, to express your interest today. Um, we do have limited number of seats to participate. And like I said, who doesn't love a little friendly competition? Um, also, if you're enjoying this data webinar series, which we hope you are, uh, there is more to come in 2025. Uh, as we alluded to in the beginning session um, at our last webinar, there are so many advanced features and queries to be able to perform in Cosmos, not just in the Slicer Dicer features, but also in the data science virtual environment. So we anticipate covering some much more advanced topics in the next webinar coming in 2025. Um, and we'll also expand on some lessons that we're gonna cover today about how to use some of those exports you get to really perform analyses in R and Python as suited to your needs. And we will also, um, Continue to expand on this big data webinar series. Um, more to come in the second quarter of 2025. So just stay tuned to your CTSC blasts and check the website for more information as it's forthcoming. So just to give you a really quick refresher on some key terminology and points that we covered from last 
time. So as I mentioned uh, last webinar that was focused on um, Cosmos Slicer Dicer for Beginners is up on CTSC's website and is available through YouTube. I have the link here so that if you haven't watched it, I hope you, I hope you have before today, um, but you can access that anytime for a refresher. Uh, we'll just quickly like cover, yeah, how to get logged in. It's okay. Yeah. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide, actually. Um, so yeah, getting access to Cosmos, obviously that's a really key step if you're going to be using Cosmos at all. So we just have the contact information here for each of the contacts at the major health systems through CTSC. And I think you can go ahead to the next slide, but you do need an Epic web user account in order to have Cosmos access. Great. So Thank you, Ashley. So I'm going to run through how to do that very quickly. I'm going to be ex specifically quick because of the prior video recording, but we do need to get to Cosmos anyway. And so we can do the additional live queries, which we're actually going to build upon our prior research questions. And so those questions were, what was the prevalence of hypertension in adults by race in the U.S.? from July 2017 through June 2024. And then very similar question, but beyond the prevalence and the by the race, we wanted to look at the trend over time. So looking at that trend by year and quarter. So we're gonna basically recreate that entire, that entire process in, uh, in Cosmos now, beginning with, logging in. So best way, you just go to user web. It, it may log me in automatically because I I already have an account, but once you're logged into user web, I have this bookmarked. I hid my bookmark so it's a little cleaner for the presentation, but usually uh, I just click my bookmark. Here, I'm going to go to Cosmos. It's going to take me to the Cosmos landing page for the user web and there's this Access Cosmos. Again, it's gonna have me log in. That is the point where you want to bookmark. And then just because it requires some degree of, of security, we do have to use a dual factor authentication. You can choose which one you'd like to use, but it, it, it uh, supports all the different authenticators out there. Okay, and so now we're in Cosmos. This is the portal. Uh, I'm going to just take a real brief tour because it will be important later on when we do what's called background query processing. Where do you find your background queries once they are done? And so again, this is a dashboard. You can change your dashboards by just simply clicking. New pop-up. Uh, there's this My Analytics dashboard. And so this is important because this is where you'll find your background query processing. So if you don't have it starred, you can star it. It then will always show up under your favorites. For me, it's a recent. But this has ba prior background queries saved here. You can save up to 15, and they only save for a short period of time, a couple, I think it's two weeks. Uh, so you can always go back and, and look at those. So when I we refer to background query processing in the future, this is where you'll find those. And it's as simple as just clicking on it. It will take you to that. You do have to pick the project. So as Ashley taught in the last webinar, we have projects, we have dashboards. This is loading this example project for the webinar. And so the background query processing, that's how you get in. It's going to take us to Slicer Dicer. I'm actually going to go to Slicer Dicer because I wanted to do a just show you how quickly this can be uh, done kind of on the fly with the caveat of these sometimes runs very quick, the middle of the day, lunchtime, probably a little slower. We'll let that think for a brief period here. Okay. 
I'm just going to take a moment to specify this is why you want to save some of your queries and possibly have them run in the background. Um, is that... We can jump forward, Ashley, and I'll let that okay. load and then sure um, thing. we'll add this to the performing the complex queries. Sure. Yeah. Because I do think, Craig, um, the first part is a little bit more of a refresher on the key terminology for navigating um, queries in general in Slicer or Dicer. So if you want to go ahead to the next slide. Um, population criteria. So this is all Cosmos terminology. There were some questions in last session of whether or not you can kind of get access to the raw data or line by line data and pull it out of Cosmos. Quick answer to that is no, you absolutely cannot. Um, it's part of the agreement with using Cosmos that they have some layers of protection on using the data. So it is really important to know and become familiar with Cosmos terminology. The criteria are essentially what you use once you've selected your data model, which is essentially kind of your first population criteria of whether you want to query um, patients. I don't know why I went forward. Whether you want to query patients, um, encounters. Would you mind going back, Craig? Um, whether you want to query patients, medications, encounters. Um, but then you can use criteria to further specify and refine your population of interest. Slices essentially allow you to create groups for comparison. Measures, the default measure will always be frequency, but you can change it to other things such as means. And when we get to more advanced features, you can actually do odds ratios or even create some of your own custom measures in Slicer Dicer. Um, your date ranges, um, fairly intuitive. What dates are you querying? Um, this does have longitudinal data as we're gonna be diving into more today. There are several visual options that you can use to visualize your data in Slicer Dicer. And of course, we're also gonna to talk today about exporting that data, including your visual options and tables for your data. Did you, um, is the query done yet, Craig? Or is it still running? Yeah, it's done here. So we can jump in and then okay. uh, we'll go back to all the, the additional criteria as well as the visual options that we're going to add on to this webinar from the last. So very quickly, taking that research question into account, we're going to start with patients. I'm going to turn on this sneak peek. Note that I think when we filmed before, there were 274 million. Now there's 280 million, so bigger even over a short period of time. The sneak peek basically cuts that down. Now there's 2.8 million. So we're starting with all patients. We wanted to look at adults. So to do that, you can either browse here, you can type here, either or, it's one and the same. And so I'm going to look for age. And there are a bunch of different age criteria that will pop up. I'm specifically looking at age at the encounter, and this is important going forward. We're gonna look at a diagnoses that are determined at an encounter. And so we want the patient to be an adult at the time of the encounter, not necessarily an adult during our uh, time period. Subtle, but it could be a difference. So we have age, we're gonna adjust that to just have adults. So we're gonna call adults 18 and older. And so there's our population, our inclusion criteria, all adults in the United States. And then before we had, uh, we skipped slices and we went back to that. I'm gonna do the same. We're gonna stick with number of patients. And we wanted to look at the prevalence of hypertension. So that is the percentage with the selected value. Again, this is all review. So I'm going to go very quickly through it. We're going to put in the diagnosis of hypertension, making note that this is going to be a grouper. And so if we wanted to hover, to find out the details of the grouper, you can hover over the gear icon and open the grouper details. Now, no, there are 1,983, these are ICD as well as SNOMED codes that make up the hypertension grouper. And there are some in here that clearly we're not really focused on and we're gonna ask an additional research question that will um, add to this, but we wanna focus on kind of the most common hypertension, essential hypertension. We don't, we don't wanna look at antepartum or preeclampsia, some of those other ones. So this will give us an opportunity once we're finished with this query to add to it, some exclusion criteria. 
So for now, I'm going to cancel that. I'm going to get back to kind of home base where we were for the first webinar. The only thing we have to do is change this age range. And we were through 2017 after the change, well, after the change from ICD-9 to 10. And we're going to go through June 30th of 2024. And that is kind of where we were before. Get out of there so it updates. And then the last thing we did uh, at the last webinar was we added the race by slice. And that, again, you can pick the top 10 if you're not sure how many there are, or you can just click the search icon here. And we're going to add them in the same kind of manner because we want them increasing. I've, of course, already done this. So make it fast for you guys. And now I'm going to get rid of this none of the above. And so this query was basically where we ended our first research question. We're going to let Ashley go through the additional criteria as well as visualizations that we're going to add to this. And then I'll ask the additional research question on top. Great. Thanks so much, Craig. So in terms of additional Cosmos terminology to add to your repertoire, um, we've got more population criteria. We've got more advanced ways of filtering down to exactly what population of interest you are trying to query. Um, as I mentioned, there are just too many things to try to cover in one session, especially for intermediate users. So we're really gonna focus more so on uh, longitudinal aspects of doing your query. Um, so this is all of the different population criteria, your visual options and your exports. But today we'll focus on, and if you could go to the next slide, Craig, yeah, the sequential criteria, which essentially allow you to uh, define an event that happens before or after another criteria, um, such as an in-hospital admission or medications prescribed um, before or after a diagnosis. Um, you can also do some include, exclude, some advanced logic features. Um, again, trying to make sure that you're really getting at the population of interest for your query. Um, so if you're familiar with basics in Excel, um, and I don't mean basic, the programming language, I mean basic as in your fundamental basics of using Microsoft Excel or in doing literature searches, right? Advanced logic techniques help you better refine and specify, I would like to have this and this criteria be present. Or, you know, if you're really trying to be more inclusive, you can add or, and if you would like to exclude certain criteria from your population of interest, you can add the not. Um, and you can get as granular as ICD-10 codes or procedure codes. Um, it's, it's really up to you on how to customize. But now that you have some familiarity with this criteria, I believe it's time to hand it back over to Craig, um, where we're going to expand on our last research question and apply this at more advanced criteria to our query. Thanks, Ashley. So our prior research question, just one more time, so everyone's on the same page, was what was the prevalence of hypertension in adults by race in the U.S. from uh, July here, 2017 through June, I think that was seven years. We can adjust that. And then by year and quarter, the new research question where we can add some of these additional features is what was the percentage of adults by race in the U.S. with essential hypertension that were prescribed in antihypertensive medication? So we, we saw the differences in the rates, and I'll reiterate that when we go back to the live demo. But then the question is becomes, are patients with diagnoses, are there equal rates of having, you know, being prescribed an antihypertensive medication? Now, just to show some of the features, I'm going to, you know, exclude gestational hypertension and preeclampsia from the hypertension diagnosis. If I really wanted to focus on essential hypertension, I would just load essential hypertension, but this gives us an opportunity to add some, some additional uh, features for you guys to try. And then the queries we're going to include and exclude some things. We're going to do some advanced logic. And then if we have time, we'll add a sequential criteria. So this is where we left off. We did look at this. Uh, I'm going to change this back to, we'll do July so that we have the exact same 
Corey. And then we did look at this uh, from a couple different perspectives. We looked at the bar chart before, and then we also looked at the line graph, which I'll show you here. And, oops. Helps to have some time. And then as this is updating, I want to point out one feature here. So this is a relatively new feature in, in cat. Well, there it left too soon. <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll go back to that when it gets to uh, a, a new query where it takes longer, we'll show you the background query processing. So to add in those additional features, you can do it depending on your research question at a couple of places. And so we currently have uh, patients with a diagnosis and we're looking at the percentage, but now we, we actually, if you look back at our research question, these are patients with hypertension and we're defining essential hypertension again, as hypertension diagnosis using the grouper and then excluding gestational and preeclampsia. So we actually have to take it out of the measure because the first thing we want to look at is just the number of patients. And so that's really easy. We can hide this measure and then we can that's interesting. Having some real world cosmos issues today. So we're getting an error down here. Uh, I will no no problem. We've done this once or twice, so just hammer it home. All right, age. And so I was gonna take it out. I was gonna take out the diagnosis anyway from number of patients. Let's get this back to what we were talking about. And then we're gonna go through June. And as you make changes here, it will continue to update. So everything, every time you're in a box and you click out, it adjusts the query. You don't have to, it's not gonna sequentially continue to run each single one. So I took out diagnosis from the measures because we wanted to add that as now part of our inclusion criteria. And so I'm gonna add that to the population. So we're gonna have a new diagnosis. Again, you can search. I recently used it. The You can have up to five recently used or you can star them, favorite them. So diagnosis of hypertension. We're moving that again out of the measure and into the population based on our, our research question. We're going to allow that to think and turn, take a sneak peek back on that will help it run a little faster. And now we wanted to exclude the two, uh, the two hypertensions related to pregnancy, gestational and preeclampsia. And there are others I'm sure, but for the in purpose of this webinar, we're just gonna do those two. And so there's a couple ways to do this. I'll show you kind of the easy way. Note that these, these pale blue boxes and, and this, this logic here. And so within the population, you have your inclusion criteria. So the patient meets this and this. Now we want something else that they don't meet. And so if I wanted to exclude something, I could go here and exclude it but that excludes this entire box, this entire pale blue box. So I actually have to add in another box of diagnoses and exclude that box. And, and so that's a subtle difference, but you can't add, I can't add in, for instance, you know, this gestational hypertension or preeclampsia, I can't add it in here because that logic is locked within this box. So I have to add another diagnosis, all box, and I like to do it in order, so I'm going to move it down. It doesn't change the result, of course. And now we're going to get rid of gestational. Hypertension. And it's the one that we want is a little bit further down right here.
So if you remember from last time's webinar, groupers are so helpful for helping you identify, obviously, large groups of ICD-10 codes, but sometimes we do want to refine our uh, queries. Yeah, and I'll show that in the uh, the next one that we add. We can, let's just pick... When it's often helpful to use the ICD codes, groupers sometimes we'll just do the first one here. So uh, we'll do this one. So we're going to get rid of its gestational hypertension without significant proteinuria. I was looking for the one that was um, more broad, but as you can see here now, this is an and box. So the patient has their over 18 or 18 and over, they have a diagnosis of hypertension, and then they also have a diagnosis of gestational uh, hypertension. And so that's not quite right. We we don't want an and here. We want an and not. And so the way that we do that is then we can just exclude this bucket. And so now it turns red and it's going to exclude that. So it's going to give us now the the, the what was the remainder. It's going to be now the the total count. And so patients that are 18 with hypertension and not gestational hypertension. And now this is the subtle difference I had mentioned before. I want to exclude patients who had both gestational hypertension and preeclampsia from the hypertension diagnosis. And so since I'm excluding both of those, I can use the same uh, box here. So note that they'll both be in here. And so we can do preeclampsia. We're going to have to change our, our webinars to uh, weekends or something. <laughs> so it runs a little faster. I think a lot of people are currently using it. So now we have our criteria, age, hypertension, not gestational hypertension or preeclampsia. So that meets our study criteria. And that's a, that just shows you how that we can, you know, use the inclusion and exclusion criteria. The other option here is if you get into more complex logic, you can use what Ashley was referring to before, just using parentheses and, or, and not. And so I'm gonna do one thing here just to reiterate this. If you look at the logic currently, it's as you would expect, it's one, two, and not three. I'm actually gonna get rid and look at the uh, the total count here. So it's 475,000. I'm gonna get rid of this preeclampsia. I'm gonna actually add another diagnosis all. I'm going to move it down just so it makes a little bit more sense to me. I will add it first. And so we're going to do preeclampsia here. Same diagnosis it was before. And we'll go to default logic. Pull this down. And again, now I'm going to do, I'm going to exclude this. So before these were in the same exclusion bucket. And I think maybe I picked a different one, but um, so you have the age diagnosis, not this and not this. The whole point is if you look at the logic now, it's one and two and not three and not four. So there's a bunch of ways to do this. You can do just as you would expect, you can change this. And it's pretty flexible. And so you will you can use what logic makes sense to you as far as the if then and not uh, criteria. And so we have one and two and not three, and this should be an or. I don't know if you saw that that was a little bit of a different number, not three or four. And there's the same number we had before. And so that all kind of works out. Uh, and so that shows the a way to do a little bit more complex of a query and add in those patients. And then if we go back to our research question, we now want to know, so we have our patient population. We have patients what we're defining as essential hypertension uh, by excluding hyper, gestational hypertension and preeclampsia from hypertension. And now we want to know, uh, is there a difference in the percent of adults 
that are prescribed an antihypertensive medication. So this is screaming um, that we need a new measure, right? We don't want number of patients. We actually want the percent or the number. We want something related to the patients on those medications. I'm going to add a race back in just so we can look at this number. Um, and we'll do it in the same order as we had before. We'll accept that and we're going to get rid of the none of the above. So I'll let that continue to work. So this is just the raw numbers. As you can see, it's not the percent that we saw before. To get us back there, we would use the percent. Um, we can use percent of sum. Or I'm sorry, uh, percentage with the value. So we took that hypertension value out. Now we want to know the percent of the patients on a medication. And so you can scroll down, you can hit medication. And what I want is a prescribed medication. And so again, going back to groupers, you can you can put metoprolol here, you can put uh, calcium channel blockers, you can even use classes of, of medications. But what uh, I'm gonna, that's the naming. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna use one of those groupers. Thinking, thinking. And now may not be the right time for it, but I know that you've got your sneak peek um, enabled. I don't know if you want to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to slow down anymore. Yeah, no, no, not definitely don't want to slow it down anymore. But there are some ways also before you launch into a query there, to get a snapshot. There are these subtleties, you know, some things are uh, have a dash, some don't. This happens not to. So that was the issue. So this is going to give us all antihypertensive medications now as a grouper. Again, if we want to see what that entails, you can simply click to open the grouper and it's going to go through, you know, there's 3,270 medications. So to do that on your own would be relatively painful. <laughs> but again, these are these are very accurate. I mean, they're used operationally. They're no different than the groupers, you know, institutions use typically. So we'll let this work, but this is going to give us now the percent of adults. There we go. So even though we saw last time that there was a clear difference in the diagnosis of hypertension, this looks a, a little bit better in the sense that it's more evened out if you have a diagnosis of hypertension that you're prescribed a medication for that and the um the you know are these significant are they not there are ways to tell and so we will we'll get into that um next time i wanted to show one feature here a lot of journals will want you to do a specific the specific range here zero to a hundred this defaulted to it to us by, you know, by default. But oftentimes, when it runs this, it may not show up as a zero to hundred, and you can you can easily change that here. So to go back to our research question, what was the percentage of adults by race in the U.S. with essential hypertension that were prescribed an antihypertensive medication? Well, that is this, and so looks pretty good. Um, and if we have some more time, we'll add in additional criteria. Back to Ashley. Great. Thanks so much, Craig. And, you know, I'm glad we do some of these live demos because you're able to sort of, if you feel like something's wrong because it's taking a while, it may not necessarily be that, um, but at least we can kind of, you can kind of see what this looks like in real time. So Slicer Dicer does give you a few different options on how to visualize your data. Um, and, you know, I can kind of share some of my preferences as well um, for what I like to use for each of the, of the visualizations. Um, so, you know, our visual options include your typical bar graph. You can do stacked bar graphs, line graphs, tree maps, pie charts, donuts. You can even do geographic maps, which I, I honestly really like, um, as well as some detailed tables and, and some cross tabs. Um, now, Tree maps, pie charts, and donuts are a little bit, it really depends on what your query and the purpose of your query is. Just like any type of analysis, what visual option is going to suit you best. Um, I like using geographic maps for um, showing, um, 
you know, responding to like um, grant reviewer comments about um, concerns about diversity or availability of potential patients to recruit. Um, you can do like a, you can restrict by um, zip code um, and actually get like a heat map of what um, disease prevalence may look like in a particular area. Um, and stacked bar graphs, I particularly like using those when you have multiple slices or, you know, again, those comparison groups, um, because you kind of, it's fairly easy, which I think Craig will show in just a second to toggle um, between the different options um, in Slicer Dicer on how you want to visualize. Um, but just know that you can also sort of play with it um, to see what might fit your query best. Um, and line graph, you know, for anything that you're looking at trends over time, I definitely recommend at least exploring the line graph option. It's gonna really help you visualize those time points that you worked hard to get into your query. Um, detailed table and cross tabs is really important when we talk about exporting. So go ahead, Craig, I'll turn it back to you. All right, so some of those options you'll see down here, it automatically will gray it out if it's not. And what you can do is, again, you can hover to discover, and it will tell you here, stacked bar graphs are only available for percent of population, number of patients, total or distinct count measures. And so that's really easy to, to show. Uh, we can simply turn this off and turn this, turn this back on, turn this off. And now you see that it, it shows up. This doesn't make a ton of sense. You can hover over it and it helps, but if you think about a figure for a journal, it's it may or may not be ideal for your purposes. But so that is the the stacked. Obviously, we have vertical and we have horizontal. We have the line graph. And again, we have another error occurring. Not sure what that is this time, but um, let's go back. Okay. Um, well, this is uh, as real as it gets. We have another error. So I'm uh, I'm going to quickly recreate uh, that query so that we can add to it. I do have it saved, but it's um, it's just about as quick to do it here. So I'm, I apologize for the uh, it's really not running as well as we would like at the moment. And so we had age. And while, while Craig is taking yeah. care of that, I'll just kind of comment quickly of, you know, um, usually when everything's running smoothly, you can toggle between your different visual options um, and just sort of see what works best. And Craig was kind of highlighting some features we covered last time of being able to hide some criteria and make it a visible visible again. So you can sort of temporarily omit criteria from your query. Um, if, you know, you wanna go back and see if uh, there's a better, you know, way to display your data. Um, I've definitely done that again, you know, I, I, I'm a fan of the um, geographic um, display, but, um, you know, that only really works for certain types of queries. And so knowing how to hide and um, unhide your um, filters and criteria can be very helpful in just toggling between these different things and trying to grab what you, what you need or what you think you need for your publication or your grant. All right, we're almost there. We'll do medications. and antihypertensives. And being that, you know, um, most major health systems in the Cleveland area are using some form of EPIC um, that includes OCHIN for the FQHCs, that means that um, when you're restricting to the Cleveland area, you're getting a fairly, um, you're getting a fairly accurate demonstration of, of what, um, what demographics or disease or you know whatever your query is focused on um, of of your Cleveland area zip codes. Uh, 
Okay. So what caused that error last time? I'm unsure of, but I know when I unchecked this and tried to go back, it wouldn't let me. So we're going to stick with this, obviously vertical, horizontal. That makes a lot of sense. And then line graph. We'll give it a second. So that, that looks pretty good. And last time we showed the feature of doing it by quarter. There does seem to be a little bit of a difference here for the COVID trend. Well, maybe not, it's kind of leveled out. But so, um, and then for this purpose, uh, the tree map, it we can click it and you can kind of show what it looks like. It's not in, it's super helpful, um, but some of the other features are kind of nice. So if you wanted to take this out and kind of manually take it out, uh, that you can do obviously by the the, the tables, I'm sorry, by the um, the graphs, or you, you, you can do it in this manner, put it into a, a table and export it. So there's two different types of tables. This is a detail table, so it actually will show you the quarters. So remember, we put this by quarter, I'll put it back to year and let it recalculate. And so it'll it'll spit a table out for the percentages by uh, now the year. And there's also this cross table function. And I'll show you how to export this. Let this think. And we do have sneak peek on, so it should run pretty quickly. And I think actually going forward, we're probably going to do screen recordings. <laughs> We've yeah. Learned yeah. our lesson. Uh, Ashley will jump into exporting and then I'll show you when that table's done, uh, how we can do that. Sure. Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, you really um, cannot... Um, you really cannot um, export the line by line data from Cosmos. You need to go in and refine your population and your measures and your criteria for, you know, what dates and, and time points and what exactly you want to be able to, um, you know, extract and analyze. Um, but you are able to, um, once you get your data within a table, um, Craig will show us there's a, a feature to be able to download the data um, that you've, you know, run your query on with it's more of a, a summative table. Um, so it doesn't, it's not quite like to go for analysis in like R or, you know, whatever platform you, you prefer using, um, but it does export into Excel. Um, for figures, you can, um, at least at one point, they had the copy and paste feature um, of just being able to copy and paste figures directly from uh, Cosmos into like a, a Word document or whatever, you know, you use to keep track of your data analysis. Um, but um, you can, you should be able to download and export as well um, for your figures. But just again, like it's not the line by line data that you're able to export. You do have to do your queries first, which is why we've, you know, spent a lot of time covering that Cosmos terminology because you need to work with it to get what kind of um, data you actually want to analyze. Did you want to add to that, Craig? So this is now cross tab. And so it's really easy. You can, you just come up here and you export, you can export this table to Excel. Um, it does ask you to put in a password. So for now, we'll just do test. It's pretty simple. And, oh, it has all of these criteria. So, um, we're not going to do that, but all you all you do is match the criteria. Obviously, remember your password, and you hit continue, and then it downloads just like any other thing. Um, then you have to use that password to open it up. So that's a very nice feature. You can do a very similar thing if you go back. You know, we had this is a little different now based on the groupings, but um, let's turn back on number. Uh, just for example, if you wanted to export this, it's really a copy. And so it, what it does is it copies this entire part of the screen and including the title. And so the title, we didn't describe this before. This is kind of, uh, I would say, not an ideal title, let's be honest, for this graph. And so you can definitely change that to whatever you want. 
it simply is adding things as you add to your population, you add to your slices, it puts in by statements, and then it picks obviously the measure here. Um, and so it's a kind of a very, if you look at that title percentage with prescription medication, it's just, so you can easily change that here. Uh, this is also changeable. This is what you, or what the, the timeline, but you can change that to whatever you want. Uh, the other features, you can add an access label. I don't know if you can see, you should be able to see that as I hover. That's pretty simple. That's just a uh, year. Uh, and it's it's getting better and better. Uh, the more, you know, there's new features added, it seems like every couple of weeks. And so you can, you can change these and then just export it uh, as you see fit. I personally, I, I like the cross tab and then... Um, Okay, I think I think we are. This is our key to take questions. So, yeah. but I like the cross tab. You can export that to CSV. Just import that into R, and you can use uh, you know ggplot to 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 make uh, graphs, or obviously in Python it works as well. So, we'll show some of that next time, and uh, and go from there. I'm gonna. Uh, back out just in case we can start taking some questions. It looks like it's, um, yeah, I, I was gonna mention Craig that it's, we're about, um, at time for asking questions. I'm not seeing any in the chat or the Q and a, um, I think there's a separate Q and a feature here. Um, not seeing that because I was going to ask if we wanted to use the time to look at sequential criteria, but, Without Cosmos Cool. Yeah. I don't know. I, that I we option. had talked about sequential criteria before right. and we were gonna add it until it kind of stopped working on us, but I'll show that feature here if, if there aren't any questions. Yeah. And so, so if we just go back, um, we're gonna, you know, again use that same uh criteria, age at encounter. We're gonna make it 18. Ashley, Shannon has a question in the chat. Oh, thanks so much. Are we able to extract any level of residential data for geospatial analysis? Um, so I believe the closest that you can get to this is um, you can possibly create some slices by um, by zip code. I mean, zip code is, is as granular as you can get with your Cosmos queries. Um, and if that is sufficient for what you're asking with your geospatial analysis, um, then yeah, I would say that you should be able to, to do that through by adding the zip code as um, slices. Do you have any thoughts on that, Craig? Yeah, you can definitely do that. And I'll show that we can actually, if you want, try it out on a uh, real patients if it, if it cooperates with us. Um, so that's uh, relatively straightforward. You can add that to your population. And so there is a finite number of zip codes you can add. And so if you try to, if you think about how many zip codes are in existence, that is too many. And so then the question becomes, is there a way that you as a user can combine your zip codes into something meaningful and give it, uh, make it into a category? And what I mean by that, I don't know if you want to look at air quality. Um, this has been shown in gun laws. Uh, so the this, this strictness of gun laws across states. Uh, if you can categorize that into a bucket and then you have a list of zip codes to put into a category, uh, that is one way to study it. And Slicer Dicer, you can, you know, if, if you're just looking at us, you can get only as specific as the zip code. You can't get... Um, any further down than that. And then the data science virtual machine is actually, you you can't even get the zip code. And so I can show that feature and in doing so, I'll also show this sequential feature. And so if we wanted to look at patients uh, who have a diagnosis of hypertension, who then go on and have a complication of that diagnosis, meaning something like a stroke, that's easy to do that. You can just simply add a sequential criterion here. This is also where you add the overlapping criteria or you can do a specific age or a date range. And so if you wanted to do a sequential criteria, you can add a diagnosis and here you could see. Uh, 
So if they go on to develop cerebral vascular disease or stroke, you can simply add that in after. And so then this will give you the way to put this in sequential. And let's say um, you wanted to, you know, look at a specific time period. That's that's easy to do as well. They, but this forces the diagnosis of hypertension to come before the diagnosis of cerebral vascular disease. And you can do the same thing for medications. For the zip code question, it's as simple as doing zip code. I think you have to do Yeah, I think we looked at this the other day. I think it's under like the patient. And so the, um, but you do have to, you can, you so postal code of residence, zip code. Mm -hmm. And so you can put in a specific code here, but then remember what that does for you is that puts you in to a specific uh, category. And so, this is a inclusion exclusion criteria. So you can do what's called add multiple values. And so you could add in a bunch of different zip codes here, just separated by commas like so, and add it and it will tell you that it, you know, it found these two and it matched them. Uh, and you can add that as a criteria. And then what you can do is you can create your own group. And so we can call this, you know, group one, but this is where, for instance, if you had like a scale, like one to 10 or one to five of air quality indices or gun laws, the strictness of gun laws, you could put those into buckets and we could call this like, you know, group one. And then you could um, accept, and then you could create another group. So I've tried uh, because I'm like, well, is there a way to actually do you know, could you put all zip codes in here? It, it would be a manual process because the moment, like let's say you had a list of all zip codes and you pasted it in here, there's there's no way to then subsequently separate those. And that's by design, right? So if you had, let's say all of the zip codes in existence and you put them in here and you go to the next, let's do something that's not overlapping with the prior criteria. Uh, and so then you could, you could call this four, four, all right, maybe there's, Okay, it found that. And so then we could call this group two. And so this would be the way that you would use uh, zip code and you could look at, you know, a specific, and, and we'll get into this in the next webinar, the geospatial mapping of this. And so, and now if you note that we have two separate groups. And so you could do group one or group two, and then you would, in the map, you would, it would, it would show the different groups. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. Yeah. There is one more question in the chat. So health systems are, I mean, you can, no, basically you can't identify by health systems. Um, everything is is um, stripped of, of identifying information. So the closest, sort of proxy that that we've used in the past that I've used in the past can't speak for Craig on this is um zip code for like in catchment areas um, pardon that. when I said by health system I meant like an encrypted identifier not like the actual name of the health system I don't even think so okay what do you mean by an encrypted identifier like like it could show health system one two three four five not saying like UNIH, Metro, Cleveland Clinic. Somewhere. Yeah, so in the data science virtual machine, there is a, oh. uh, that's that's not, not in Slicer Dicer, but in the data science virtual machine, there is a, a it's a key, right, for that system, mm -hmm. hospital system. Uh, and so that would link, but yeah, you wouldn't know what it would, but it would allow you to differentiate between systems. In Slicer okay. Dicer, uh, I, I I have never come across that feature. I'll look into it though and, and let you, who asked that question? I'll I'll look into that exact, cause I, uh, I'm i not aware in the slicer dicer of that option. And yeah, it's um, not everything that's in, there are actually two different data sets between slicer dicer and the data science virtual machine. Uh, because if you think if you have access to all the row level data, you could probably start identifying people <laughs> or uh, at least health systems. So 
when it was expertly de-identified, it's called the Eddy data set, they uh, are very careful that that it, you won't be able to identify something like a health system. And that is, um, it's a, it's, it's a slippery slope, right? Cause you want to do, you want to see those things, but it's also part of the rules of the road using Cosmos that you actually don't try and do that. I mean, even if you could, you shouldn't try. And so it's, uh, but it is for, um, for population health management, it's super important. And that's an ongoing discussion of how much data is available, what's going to be available in the future. But yes, you can in the uh, data science or machine get to a, a hospital system. So sorry guys for the glitches today. The uh, you know, Sometimes it runs very cleanly and sometimes it's just like this. And so it's good that you're able to see it and you can troubleshoot your way out of it. Just restart the query. Um, obviously going back, you can, you know, I have a lot of some of these queries saved. You can actually just go back to my analytics and this may or may not be a faster, depending on what you're querying, this may or may not be a faster way to get to your query because it does do some updating uh, and see, so that, that, that happened actually pretty quickly. So this is a prior saved query from this morning to make sure everything worked and, you know, you can get back to it pretty quickly. So feel free when you see that spinning wheel to save it. Uh, and then if something crashes, you can kind of easily get back to it. I think we're at the top of the hour. Anything else? Yeah. What other questions? Let's see. Do you have? Great. Thank you, guys. <laughs>